Oh, good. I don't have to handle the recording. So, um, everybody, welcome back to uh, now the last session of VCOMSEEK. Um, so, the first talk will be on dynamic partitioning of search patterns for approximate pattern matching using search schemes. Uh, the talk will be given by Luca Renders and his joint work with uh, Kathleen Marshall and Jean Fostier. Um, Luca, please. Okay, th thank you for the introduction and uh, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, everybody, depending on where you are. I uh, will present to you our research paper. And as a first step, I will try to explain to you what are search schemes and what problem do they try to solve. So, search schemes are an algorithmic technique for approximate pattern matching where uh, you can find all occurrences of a search pattern in a search text uh, within a certain number of errors. So this could be under a distance metric like the Hamming or edit distance. Now, classical backtracking algorithms are already capable of doing this, but they are unfeasibly slow. And why are they so slow? Um, let's take a look at our search tree. So imagine that you've got a search text that is very complex, like a, a genome, and uh, you store every suffix or every prefix in this tree. Now, you can imagine that in the uh, neighborhood of the root, this is going to be very, very dense. This is because, well, if you have a subsequence of 10 base pairs long, it's very likely that every subsequence of 10 base pairs long is going to be present in your complex genome. However, if you go deeper into the tree, let's say at length 200, um, then it's going to be less sparse because not every sequence of lengths 200 is going to be present in your genome. Now, what does this mean for your backtracking algorithm? Well, um, it means that if you are searching and you're doing backtracking, you're going to be spending most of your time in that neighborhood of the root. And that means that many of your clock cycles are going to be wasted on branches that will turn out to be unsuccessful anyway. So search schemes try to mitigate this and try to reduce the time spent on branches that are unsuccessful and try to go deeper into your tree to those uh, sparser areas. Now, the simplest uh, search scheme to explain is the pigeonhole principle. So imagine that you have four post boxes and three pigeons arrive. Well, you can distribute the pigeons however you like. There's always going to be at least one of those post boxes that is empty. And we can extrapolate this to our pattern matching problem. So imagine that we have a pattern that we have partitioned into four parts. Well, we can distribute our three errors that we allow as much as possible. There's always going to be one of our parts or at least one of the parts that is going to be error free. And that is what we like because error free means that we can do exact matching, which is a lot cheaper than approximate matching. So if you go back to our search tree, what we would do is we would start with an exact match to go deeper into our tree. And only when we arrive at our sparse area, only then do we start our approximate searching, which is, includes branching and is more uh, expensive. Now, how would the search procedure work? Well, imagine that we're looking for this specific error distribution. We would start with an exact match of what our error-free part, which is followed by an approximate backward search here of the first part and an approximate forward search of the final two parts. Of course, we do not know this error distribution beforehand, so we'll have to repeat this procedure for each of the parts. But what this example shows us is that we need to be able to switch from approximate backward searching to approximate forward searching. And this uh, explains why we need a bidirectional index. And one of those indexes is the bidirectional FM index. So remember that a classical FM index can only do uh, approximate backward searching. And a classical FM index can, given a pattern P and its suffix array range for any character C of your alphabet, it can return the suffix array range of a new pattern CP. Now, by adding the BWT of the reverse text to our FM index we can and uh, related data structures, we can extend this functionality so that this index works bidirectional. So given a pattern P and its suffix array ranges, so that is the range over the suffix array of the text and the suffix array of the reverse text, for any character C, we can now return the suffix array ranges of both pattern PC and pattern CP. So this means that at any point we can add a character to the left or to the right, and it means that we can switch at any moment between forward or backward approximate matching. Now, for the theoretical definition of a search scheme, a search scheme is a set of searches, and it's always for k errors and p parts. And each search is a tuple of arrays pi, l, and u. 
So pi is a permutation over one to p, and it defines the order in which the uh, parts of your pattern are going to be processed. Um, L and U define a lower and an upper bound. So L tells you how many errors do I need to have at least at this point, and U tells you how many errors at most are allowed at this point. To further clarify this, I'll show you a simple example of a search scheme. So I'm going to explain to you the search scheme by Kucherov et al um, for two errors and three parts. So the first search uh, starts with an exact match of your first part and is then followed by an approximate match, which allows up to two errors for the second part. And again, an approximate match, which allows up to two errors for the third part. Remember that these errors are cumulative. So if you have found one error in the middle part, then you're only allowed up to one error again in the final part. Now, the core idea of search schemes is that we are going to let uh, the number of allowed errors gradually increase. And this is very clear in search number two. So search number two starts with an exact search of your final part and is then followed by an approximate backward search of the middle part, which allows up to one error. And this is followed by an approximate backward search of the first part, which allows up to two errors. So here we see that gradual increase. And the same gradual increase can also be seen in search number three. And what is also seen in search number three is the, really the need for the bidirectional index. So we start again with an exact search of the middle part this time, then an approximate backward search, which allows up to one error for the first part, followed by an approximate forward search. So we're switching direction here uh, for the third part. Now, um, this brings us to the problem of partitioning. So we can partition our reads um, uniformly so that each part gets the same size. But there's a problem. As I already tried to tell you, these searches are not entirely symmetrical. So the first search starts with an exact search and then an approximate search, which allows up to two errors. While the two other searches uh, have an approximate search after the exact matching phase that only allows up to one error. So the expected workload of the first search is going to be higher than the expected workload of the second and third search. Um, Kucherov et al. already noted this, and they uh, calculated that if you increase the size of the first part and decrease the sizes of the second and third part, the gain that you get from the first search is going to be bigger than the disadvantage from the final two search. So this is what we call static partitioning. So we find a partition that is more optimal um, regarding to the expected workload of the different searches. So you can see the first part here has increased. And this means that the subtree for the first search after our exact matching phase is going to be smaller. And it's less of a problem that we're going to start branching with these two errors already than it was if uh, that part was, was a little bit smaller. Now, there's still a problem here because this is the best solution on average. Um, not all reads were made equal, and not all reads uh, and not all parts of reads are made equal. So um, let me show you a quick example. Um, imagine that this is your partitioning of a certain read that you had. It's a fictitious example, but um, here we see that the first part is larger because we calculated that on average this was going to be the best approach. But we see that uh, this first part only has about two thousand occurrences, while the two other parts have. 52,000 occurrences and 12,000 occurrences. And if you know that the number of occurrences equals um, the number of leaves in your subtree, then you can see that, well, uh, the subtrees for the second part and the third part are going to be a lot bigger than that search tree for the first part, even though the expected workload was higher for the search that starts um, with the exact match of the first part. Now, um, what I would do as a human looking at this is say, OK, maybe for this particular read, um, let us decrease the size of the first part and increase especially the size of the second part. So that's what this example here shows you. Um, and you can see that the number of occurrences of the different parts are more balanced now. And this is exactly what our dynamic algorithm tries to do. So it looks at the number of occurrences that we have over parts and it sees, OK, maybe I should increase this one or decrease this one to get a better balance of number of occurrences. Of course, the algorithm is a little bit more complicated because it also takes into account the expected workload. But for more details on this, I refer to our research paper. Um, let us now look at a real example. So this is the search scheme by Kucherov et al. with four errors and five parts. Um, and here on the slide, you can see the static partitioning of this example. Now, um, the read is also present on the slide, and um, 
if I had taken another read, I would have gotten the same partitioning again, because this is a static partitioning. It's always going to be the same. And what immediately strikes me if I look at this example is that for this fourth part here, uh, there are, it has length 19, which is not a lot smaller than the other of the parts and even bigger than the third part. It only has 101 occurrences. And if I compare this to the other numbers, it's, it's really small and it shows us, okay, um, maybe this partitioning for this example is not the best idea. Maybe this fourth part should be smaller because um, the searches that start with this, it's a ridiculously small subtree that needs to be explored. While, for example, the fifth part has over 60,000 occurrences, so a much bigger search tree. And this is exactly what the dynamic partitioning algorithm did. So this is the result. And you can see, well, yes, that fourth uh, part now has length nine and it has 8,000 occurrences. So that's a quite a big relative increase, but in absolute numbers, it's really small. And we can see that the 10 nucleotides that, it, that it's lost have gotten have gone to the first and last part because there are more searches that focus on these parts and they had many occurrences. Now, um, this is uh, the results in terms of occurrences, but what does it mean for actual workloads? Well, uh, I have a graph that shows us. On the uh, vertical axis, we see the number of nodes visited for each search, and that's uh, the size of the search space that was explored. And on the horizontal axis, we see the eight searches of this search scheme. And you can see that for searches two and five, the number of nodes visited has increased and maybe even quite significantly in absolute uh, in relative numbers. But this increase pales in comparison with the decrease of the six other searches, which have also decreased by quite uh, a lot if you look at it. And in total, we've gone from over more than half a million nodes visited for the static partitioning to only about 300,000 nodes visited for dynamic partitioning, which is a decrease of uh, almost 44%. Now, um, the dynamic partitioning is not the only improvement that we have implemented. We've, only impl uh, we've also implemented two other improvements. The first one is a more efficient memory layout to reduce cache misses. So during the approximate pattern matching procedure, we iterate over our alphabet. And with each iteration, it gets a cache miss for each character in your alphabet. By interleaving the bit vectors for the different characters of your alphabet, we can reduce the number of cache misses. And uh, this results in an overall reduced runtime of 37% for uh, edit distance four. Uh, for more details on how this interleaving works, I refer to our research paper. And the second improvement that we have implemented is that we've reduced the redundancy between parts for the edit distance. So, um, with the edit distance, you can introduce gaps. And if those gaps are at the end or at the beginning of a part, it's not always clear, uh, is this an error for this part or for the part next to it? And to, in a naive implementation, this would be calculated several times and that's not ideal. So we've uh, introduced a rather technical technique to reduce that redundancy. And again, for more details, I refer to the research paper. I can say that this redundancy increases exponentially with the number of allowed errors. And for edit distance four, the runtime was reduced by more than 50%. Now I'll show you the results um, of dynamic partitioning and I'll also compare our implementation to a state-of-the-art implementation. So what we've done is we've aligned 100,000 Illumina reads of length 101 base pairs to the human reference genome, both the forward and reverse strand. And uh, we've compared uh, their runtimes, uh, which is on the vertical axis, to, uh, to each other for different partitioning strategies. And you can see that uh, for edit distance one, our uh, runtime has increased uh, a little bit. But this is not a problem because while well, the runtime was already quite slow for edit distance one, and it's also an indication that well, dynamic partitioning introduces a small overhead. It's a, a new algorithm that needs to be performed by your processor. Um, and the, as you, if you look at the, the search space that was explored, that has decreased, but the overhead was just bigger just because it was already such a small runtime. If we then look at the uh, higher edit distance values, we see a different story. We see that for dynamic partitioning, the runtime is always significantly lower than for static and dynamic uh, for static and uniform partitioning. If you look at edit distance three. Uh, the runtime for uniform and static partitioning are very close to each other. And this is because for this particular search scheme, which is, which is the search scheme by Kutcher uh, et al. for um, 
K plus one parts, uh, the searches for at a distance three are actually very symmetrical. So there is little to no gain from finding an optimal static partitioning, but there is a gain from switching to dynamic partitioning because this looks at every read individually and finds a better partitioning per read. And for at a distance four, we see again the same story that dynamic partitioning performs better than static partitioning and than uh, uniform partitioning. I can also say that we've done the experiment for 100,000 subsequence of specific biosciences reads. These are present in our research paper and for more details on them, I, I refer again to the paper. And then a final comparison, we've compared the runtime of Colomba, which is R2 to Bolo. And here you can see, so this is a bit all the improvements in place. Here we can see that for every edit distance, the runtime has reduced significantly. You can see that for edit distance four, R2 Colomba is able to map those 100,000 tweets in less than three minutes, while the Bolo tool takes 10 minutes to do the same task. Now to summarize, uh, we have created a tool called Colomba, which implements a more efficient memory layout. Uh, it reduces redundancy for the edit distance metric and it implements dynamic partitioning. As an extra feature, we've also implemented the fact that Columba can handle custom search schemes as long as it's a valid search scheme. So it's not limited to the search schemes already present in literature or in our source code. As a final note, um, our implementation is available on GitHub. And I thank you for your attention and I would gladly answer some questions. Okay, uh, we have we have a question from Ben, minor question. In the final case of the two error static partitioning, do you need to allow up to two errors in the rightmost segment rather than one? Is two errors on the right not covered by the first case? Um, I, do, I think it's not covered. I need to look at the slide in more detail, but um, this, what I did not show on the slide is the lower bound um, array, uh, which is different for the third and for the first search, that's why uh, there's a difference and what, uh, but it could be that some of the searches, what we've, uh, we've looked at some of the search schemes ourselves and we've noted that sometimes there is indeed some redundancy between the searches and it could be better to adapt the lower and upper bounds for searches, but I, I'm not sure if this particular search scheme was one of those. Okay. Um, so I don't see any more questions, but I have a question which, Maybe I'm going to have to contact you offline, which is about the, the, you said if you interleave the bit vectors, you reduce the cache misses. So this is, uh, the cache misses are sort of a general pain for FM indexes. So is that something general where you think um, that that could be applied to sort of any FM based software or? Yes, I, it can be applied to any FM based software. So what we did is we've interleaved the, the bit vectors of our characters of our alphabet. And if you use a four letter alphabet, it fits perfectly. So if you want to iterate over your entire alphabet, you have only one cache miss, or actually two because we use a rank nine data structure, but um, there's one for the entire alphabet instead of uh, one for each of the letters of the alphabet. If you have more letters in your alphabet, then, um, the effect will not be as great, but it's still going to be better than if you wouldn't interleave them. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll have to, to check the paper and, and maybe get in touch with you about that. Um, great, so we're just about on time. Thank you again. Um, and now if you could stop screen sharing.